Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that this conference is being recorded. At the moment, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those that are connected by telephone and require operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. For those online that require assistance, please use the chat box, box on your screen. I would like to now hand the meeting over to your host, Jessica Fournier, Improvement Lead at Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Please go ahead. Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Jessica Fournier, and I am your host for today's webinar, which is the fifth webinar in CFHI's new discussion series, Community Dementia Care and Support, Innovation Supporting People Living with Dementia and Care Partners Closer to Home. We are pleased to offer French simultaneous interpretation on today's webinar. If you would like to see and hear the presentation in French today and you have not yet been transferred, you can let us know in the chat box on the bottom right of your screen. Once you have been transferred, you will need to shut down your computer speakers and dial the number on the screen. We also invite you to share your questions and comments at any point using our chat box in either English or French. We will reserve verbal discussion of comments and questions to the end of the webinar, but encourage all of you to respond to comment and answer questions in the chat as you wish as we go along. Also, a note that we will summarize the chat questions and comments after the webinar and translate this to both official languages for sharing in a post-webinar synopsis. The post-webinar email will also include links to the recording of today's webinar. Our participants for today include representatives from across Canada. We are joined by representatives from regional health authorities, universities, Dementia Advocacy Canada, ministries, Canadian Institute of Health Research, Health Canada, AgeWell, Canadian Frailty Network, Canadian Medical Association, Royal College of Family Physicians, and government health departments across Canada, as well as many more. Before we go further, I want to begin this webinar by acknowledging that we are meeting on land that has been inhabited by Indigenous people since the beginning. In particular, we acknowledge that I am hosting this webinar from Perth, Ontario, which is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, Huron-Wendat, and Odinathani, St. Lawrence, Iroquois people. The territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. I encourage you all to share in the chat box the territory and land you are joining us from today. Our CFHI team involved in creating and producing this webinar series includes Neil Dreimer, Lindsay Yarrow, Emily Lalonde, and myself, Jessica Fournier. My colleagues, Sheena, Kelly, and Isabel, are behind the scenes producing the webinar. Our presenters today are Dr. Deborah Morgan and Dr. Megan O'Connell. I'll now take this time to turn it over to them to introduce themselves. Deborah, thanks for being here today. Over to you to introduce yourself. Thank you. Um, I'm Deborah Morgan. I'm a professor at the University of Saskatchewan at the Canadian Center for Health and Safety in Agriculture. And um, I um, have been leading the Rural Dementia Action Research, our radar team, um, since um, for about the last 20 years. And um, I'm a nurse by background. Great. Thank you for being with us today, Deborah. Megan, would you please introduce yourself next? My name is Megan O'Connell. I'm a professor in psychology at the University of Saskatchewan. And I'm a clinical psychologist, and I specialize in clinical neuropsychology. And I spend about 20% of my time in clinical practice, as well as doing research. Great. Thank you, Megan. We also have our session moderators, Mimi Lowy Young and Mary Beth Whiten, who will lend their expert perspective to the information presented and to the comments and questions you enter in the chat. Mimi, over to you to introduce yourself. Thank you very much, um, and it's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Mimi Lowy Young, and I'm the chair of the board of directors of AgeWell, a network of researchers creating technological solutions and innovations to support healthy aging and as well uh, supporting people with dementia and their caregivers. Uh, I am uh, also the former CEO of the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, and I am currently a senior fellow and adjunct faculty at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you, Mimi. Mary Beth, over to you for a brief introduction. Thanks very much. Uh, my name is Mary Beth Whiten, and I'm 54 years old. Um, I was diagnosed at the uh, six years ago, and I uh, have a diagnosis of probable front temporal dementia. I am the co-chair of Dementia Advocacy Canada, which is a national advocacy group for people with dementia and, and care partners. I'm also a member of the Ministerial Advisory Board on Dementia to Canada's Health Minister, and I'm involved in uh, numerous projects and teams in varying ty types of roles. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mary Beth. And so our objectives for today are to provide an overview of CFHI's Community Dementia Care and Support webinar discussion series, broaden awareness and discuss two innovations that can improve early diagnosis and or post-diagnostic care and supports in the community, and today we will be focused on rural and remote memory clinics and rural and remote memory clinics 2.0, and facilitate a discussion around the potential spread of innovations to improve care and supports in the community for people living with dementia and care partners. CFHI is a not-for-profit organization with a mission to collaborate with partners to identify and spread proven innovations to improve healthcare closer to home and community in areas of shared, provincial, territorial, and federal priority. The impact of our work is lasting improvement in patient, family, and caregiver experience and health, work life of providers, and value for money. We believe in the collective power for change, so partnering with others where we can add value is central to our work and vision. Our Community Dementia Discussion Series will broaden awareness and discuss innovations that aim to improve timely diagnosis of dementia in primary care, post-diagnostic supports, including coordination and navigation. To find more information about the topics and webinar dates, you can visit our webpage on the CFHI website. If you know someone who would like to attend this webinar, please send them the link to the register to receive the information. If you know about an innovation that could spread across Canada that improves timely, compassionate dementia diagnosis in primary care or coordination and navigation of post-diagnostic care and support that would work in the COVID-19 context, please email us at the email provided on the screen to let us know. You can contact us at the email provided if you would like to receive a package to help us promote this webinar discussion series through your website or through social media. For your consideration today and through the series, what promising innovations exist that could be spread across Canada, including in the COVID-19 context? What is the feasibility of your organization and or community to implement and spread the innovation? Where can CFHI add value to support a multi-jurisdictional approach to spreading these innovations? And what are the partnership opportunities to help spread innovations to improve community dementia and care support? We'll now take a few moments to reflect on the importance of improving access to diagnosis and dementia care and supports in the community. I'd like to ask Mary Beth and Mimi a couple of questions. Mary Beth, we'll begin with you. What can we do right now to support people who require assessment for cognitive impairment to get that assessment now? And how can we connect people to the right health, social, and rehabilitation supports immediately after diagnosis? Excellent questions. Uh, thanks for them. I think uh, I'll, I'll start off with giving some just stark facts. In 2015, 41% of Canadian primary care doctors felt they were well prepared to manage community dementia care in the community. Now, in comparison, 69% of doctors in Norway and 63% in the UK felt well prepared. So. To support people who require assessment for cognitive impairment to get that assessment, then we need to immediately change this statistic, this statistic which is two out of five Canadian doctors feel well prepared to manage community dementia care. Today, a person's opportunity to be diagnosed well and live well with dementia depends on factors including their location, their ethnicity, their age, and, and even whether they have a, a care partner with them. So a timely diagnosis of dementia is an important step in receiving the tailored support and treatment that enables people to lead full lives and for as long as possible. 
So to, to support people who require assessment, then we need to support the Canadian family physician who needs help in diagnosing dementia. We don't need any more surveys and research. We just need to do this. You know, and finally, so providing support to people after diagnosis is incredibly crucial for, in particular, the person with dementia. Canada does not have an easy to access and navigate pathway to connect people to the right health, social, and rehabilitation supports immediately after diagnosis. So there's a lack of access to specialists, and as we know, particularly in remote and rural areas. The knowledge of community-based resources, and you know, this, uh, this shows time constraints. Canada needs patient navigators to help them through this complex navigation to supports. So upon diagnosis, the person should be supported by a name coordinator or um, a navigator of care of with who they can create a care plan. This plan should be reviewed once a year and refreshed as when the person's needs change. And this is a, this is a model that comes out of the, uh, England. So some examples of things that are already working, memory clinics, first link, uh, primary care, dementia, assessment and treatment, algorithm project, and two of the things that we're going to be hearing more about today, which is the radar team and uh, PC data support tools. So some comments there, and over to you now, Mimi. Thank you, Mary Beth. So Mimi, I'd like to ask you, how can technology support primary care physicians and care teams to diagnose dementia and direct post-diagnostic support? So let me um, start my uh, uh, brief uh, comment and answer to this very important question, is that we have seen how technology can support primary care and, and, and care teams uh, to diagnose and support um, post-diagnostic post periods um, as a result of COVID. And, and we've, we've begun to understand the role that technology can play to support individuals. Um, so in the absence of, of a cure to, uh, for dementia, technology-based solutions can really promote, number one, cognitive health and active lifestyles to help delay the onset of cognitive decline and provide assistance to those who have already experienced some level of impairment. Innovation innovative solutions can also provide early diagnosis, uh, allowing older adults and their caregivers to get connected to community-based services as quickly as possible. Uh, the inclusion of technology innovation in the toolbox of Canadians facing dementia will ensure that the national dementia strategy is implemented with a forward-thinking mindset and takes into consideration the current and future needs of Canadians. Uh, AgeWell, a network center of excellence of researchers across the country, are developing and launching a promising innovation that focus mainly on home and community settings, but also have primary care, memory clinics, and long-term care. These technologies aim to improve the lives of Canadians and were developed with input from older adults living with dementia and their caregivers, which are key members of any care team. So let me give you two quick examples of both early detection diagnosis and post-diagnostic supports at home. And a little plug for the next um, webinar on December 8th, which will be addressing both of these uh, innovations. Um, speech analysis and eye tracking technology uh, exist to provide input on the diagnosis of dementia. One example is Winterlight Labs, which uses artificial intelligence to analyze speech and detect cognitive impairment associated with dementia. An example of post-diagnosis support at home is um, apps that assist with daily task reminders, such as called Data Day, which again will be um, highlighted in the December 8th um, CFHI webinar. There are other uh, uh, technologies such as smart home and voice technology that can help with management um, of uh, devices that extend autonomy of individuals uh, living with dementia. So those are only two examples, but many other examples, and really 
um, we have begun to understand how technology can, can truly support both primary care physicians and care teams um, in the post-diagnostic period. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mimi. I'd now like to hand it over to Dr. Deborah Morgan to present on the um, rural and remote memory clinics. Deborah, over to you. Hello, um, thank you, and hello everyone. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to talk about our clinics, our uh, rural primary health care memory clinics. And I want to acknowledge the work of Dr. Julie Kosnuk in co-leading this research. I acknowledge that I live and work on Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. My talk today is about rural primary health care memory clinics, but I need to go back to 2004 when the radar team launched a specialist memory clinic at the University of Saskatchewan with the mandate of increasing access to diagnosis and management of complex atypical hard-to-diagnose dementias for individuals living in rural Saskatchewan. The Rural and Remote Memory Clinic, or RMC, started as a research demonstration project and is now funded by the Ministry of Health. The clinic also supports research and training and is a hub for remotely delivered interventions and diagnostic support to primary care providers and rural people with dementia across Saskatchewan. A short video is available on the link uh, shown. Clinic patients come to Saskatoon for a full day assessment by the RMC interdisciplinary team and most go home with a diagnosis at the end of the day. We're now offering this virtually because of the pandemic. Although the mandate of this specialist clinic is to see a typical complex patients, we get many referrals for less complex Alzheimer's disease, for example. And we've learned that many primary care physicians are not comfortable or confident making dementia diagnoses. We conducted a provincial consultation that also identified a need for strategies to support dementia diagnosis and management in primary health care. So this became a focus of the research I'll talk about today. To move forward with that, we began by partnering with the Rural Health Region in southeastern Saskatchewan. We established a regional steering committee to guide the research, and then we conducted a regional needs assessment that identified um, key issues in dementia care. Sorry, I'm forgetting to tell you to advance the slides. Please uh, continue advancing. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, and uh, the regional needs assessment identified three key issues in dementia care in rural settings. Challenges in early identification and diagnosis, lack of access to decision support tools, and the need for team-based care versus working in silos. Our goal then was to work with rural primary health care teams to develop an evidence-informed model for dementia care that's effective, feasible, sustainable, and adaptable to different rural contexts. We're now working with four primary health care teams, all about a four to five hour drive from Saskatoon. To ensure, uh, next slide, uh, an evidence-based approach, we first reviewed the literature and identified seven elements of comprehensive primary health care for dementia that have been associated with better outcomes. <clears throat> Most of this research, however, was not done in rural settings. So we took these seven elements shown in the boxes and grouped them into three domains, the colored gears, interprofessional care, specialist to provider support, and decision support tools. After developing this conceptual model from the literature, we then worked intensively with one primary health care team to operationalize or put into practice these elements in ways that worked in the rural context and addressed identified needs. What came out of this was a multidisciplinary memory clinic that's held every month or two in the primary care clinics. And after many iterations, the first one-day memory clinic was held in Kipling in 2017. Next slide. Uh, so the domain of interprofessional care includes a multidisciplinary clinic teams, including a physician or a nurse practitioner, home care nurse, social worker, occupational therapist, physical therapist, Alzheimer's Society First Link Coordinator, and primary health care facilitator. Care management is coordinated with multiple team members on clinic day, and clinic team members use a shared EMR. And thirdly, education and support for patients and families is provided by involving home care, social work, and the Alzheimer's Society in the teams. 
Two new patients and their families are assessed, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. The assessment begins with a brief team huddle, followed by a meeting with the team and patient and family to discuss their concerns. The patient then undergoes separate assessments by each provider, while the family meets with the Alzheimer's Society and home care or social work. A final case conference is held with everyone together to discuss the results, recommendations, and follow-up plans. Next slide. The second domain is decision support tools, and the main tool is the primary care dementia assessment and treatment algorithm, or PC data, created by team member Dr. Dallas Seitz at the University of Saskatchewan. PC data is based on Canadian consensus guidelines for dementia and includes visit flow sheets, online self-learning modules credited by the College of Family Physicians, care pathways, and other resources. Next slide. The original paper-based PC data flow sheets that we started with were adapted by the teams by dividing the assessment into separate sections for each team member, adding sections for occupational therapy and physical therapy, and then embedding the flow sheets in the team's electronic medical record that is accessible by all the team members. We also developed a clinic handbook as a decision support tool that includes the flow sheets, educational materials, role descriptions for all the team members, and resources such as templates for letters with recommendations for the patient and family. Next slide. The third domain uh, is specialist to provider support, and this happens in several ways. One is through education to the teams. Each memory clinic team takes part in education sessions with the PC data developer, and then ongoing education topics are identified by the teams, and we find experts to um, give an education session. If after the clinic the primary health care team feels that additional testing and support for diagnosis or management are needed, patients can be referred for virtual support provided by the specialist RMC in the yellow box. And Dr. O'Connell will talk more about this in her presentation. Next slide. These are the teams that we're working with. Uh, most of the development work was done over several years with the Kipling team on the top left. And then we gradually spread to other teams, making adaptations to fit the team configuration and context. For example, Weyburn is the only team with social workers and is located in a larger center with 11,000 population compared to 1 to 2,000 in the other communities. And all the teams are led by nurse practitioners, except for Weyburn, which is uh, led by a family physician. Next slide. These are some of the activities that RADAR has undertaken in spreading the clinics. Uh, we've developed and maintained relationships with health authority leadership to make sure they're aware of the clinics and connect us with the right people to help us identify new sites and to help us understand the impact of health region reorganization over the last two years. Saskatchewan went from 13 regions to one with 39 networks and this is still evolving over the last several years. We've created a video to increase public awareness and interest. We've worked with teams to adapt team member roles to new clinics with different configurations of members. We hired the nurse practitioner of the first team and a former primary health care team facilitator to support new teams with operational and clinical issues. We've incurred mentorship across teams by having new team members shadow an established team. And our regional steering committee keeps us in touch with the bigger picture in the area. We have developed a multi-year plan for spreading that includes recruiting and training new teams, including a one-day workshop with an existing team and two new teams, most likely to be uh, held by WebEx now due to the pandemic. Next slide. We've also implemented strategies to support the sustainability of the existing clinics. We hold regular work group meetings with teams to maintain relationships and support problem solving and to help us understand sustainability issues. We hold monthly check-in meetings jointly with all of the primary health care team facilitators and several managers. We provide resources such as laptops and conference phones and funding for MOCA and other training. We hold regular targeted education sessions on topics identified by the teams and we've supported team members to attend conferences and our annual Rural Dementia Summit. Next slide. There have been challenges in scaling up the clinics. It's difficult to identify new teams when there's ongoing regional health system reorganization, leadership changes, and, and competing priorities for leadership and healthcare providers, especially with the COVID pandemic. 
uh, different EMR systems. Um, we have interested teams on a different EMR than the one we made the flow sheets in. Lack of human resources in new teams, therapies especially. So we've been working to see if parts of their assessment could be done by others or include a screening assessment to identify patients needing later referral. And being at a long distance from the teams makes it challenging for us to have frequent visits to the sites or in-person meetings with leadership. And we wanted the model to be well tested across different team configurations before spreading into multiple teams at once, so we have been spreading slowly to date. Next slide. We published two papers on the development and implementation of the memory clinics. Next slide. And we're now focused on measuring clinic outcomes and spreading and sustaining the clinics. We have a number of outcome studies underway, although data collection was on hold because the clinics were closed for six months due to the pandemic. But we are collaborating with teams to develop action plans to spread and sustain the clinics. We're evaluating the education sessions, assessing care partner outcomes. We're studying patient and family experiences with the clinics studying patient quality of life and service needs before and after the evaluation in the clinic. And in partnership with the Alzheimer's Society, we're examining the role of the first link coordinators in the clinics. And we also have other uh, outcome studies that are ready to go that have ethics approval but have been uh, delayed by the pandemic in the blue box there. Next slide. Uh, these are just some findings from the study of patient and family experiences. They report they feel comfortable. The clinics are convenient because they don't have to travel to large urban centers. They feel supported. They appreciate the team's expertise and sensitivity, and they value the information uh, on the patient's condition and services available to help them uh, all with future planning. And this information will continue to be collected and is important to guide future operation of the memory clinics. Next slide. Um, that's the end of my presentation. I'd like to thank all of our funding partners for this research. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me by email. And the Radar website also has a lot of information about our research program. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Deborah, for your presentation. We would now like to ask you to answer a few questions about rural primary health care memory clinics. I will read these out. Prior to this webinar, were you aware of rural primary health care memory clinics? Answer yes or no. And the second question is, I know more about rural primary health care memory clinics than I did before participating in this webinar on a five-point scale. Strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree. I'll just give a couple of moments for that. And I also invite you to type any questions you have about rural primary health care memory clinics into the chat box and we will address them in the Q&A portion of our webinar after our next presentation. Okay, thank you for uh, filling out the poll. We will now move over to the next presentation. I would now like to hand it over to Dr. Megan O'Connell for the Rural and Remote Memory Clinic 2.0 presentation. Megan, over to you. Great, thank you. I have to figure out how to do the slides. I might not be able to easily do that. I'm going to have to just get you to advance the slides, if you don't mind. That's great. Let me know when you want to advance, and we'll do that for you. You can uh, advance right now. That would be great. Thanks. All right. Um, so the work that I'm going to talk about now did come uh, partly from my work as the um, one of the clinicians in the Rural Remote Memory Clinic. And we discovered, of course, that although diagnostic services are really important, there were few post-diagnostic services, particularly in areas that I'll talk about in a moment. So as part of CCNA Phase 2, Team 18 um, has a suite of remotely delivered interventions, interventions that are using technology to reach people in rural Saskatchewan, and I'll show those in a moment. But as we started uh, implementing the RMCI, which is the Rural Remote Memory Clinic Interventions, we discovered we were getting people who were not um, diagnosed with dementia, who were having challenges in their cognition, say due to sleep disturbance, and despite treating the sleep disturbance, they were still having challenges, which is exactly kind of what I thought might happen. Um, and in fact, these were people with undiagnosed dementia. So we decided to develop the RMC 2.0 uh, to reach these people. 
And this is just a brief overview of the RMCI. This is a um, post-diagnostic support. It is integrated with the numerous post-diagnostic services provided by the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan. But we particularly began in year one of uh, CCNA, a sleep treatment, a remotely delivered treatment for sleep disturbance for people living with dementia. We also delivered cognitive rehabilitation, so that's a uh, intervention that uses understanding of the way the nervous system is organized. And we are working right now on um, social network intervention, uh, socialization intervention, and Indigenous caregiver supports. But through this, as I said, we discovered we still have many problems with people with undiagnosed concerns. So, so we um, developed a triage and collaborative care model where specialists remotely engage with primary care providers to provide a support for, for a diagnosis of dementia. And in contrast to the rural remote memory clinic, or their primary care memory clinics. This one was to serve all of Saskatchewan, not just those in rural Saskatchewan. But I will say that the um, technologies used to reach people were designed to increase accessibility for those in rural Saskatchewan. And we got some funding for this work. Um, just to be kind of begin to start it, we got the funding and we began uh, this right as the pandemic started. And I don't know about for many other provinces, but for us, everything kind of shut down for several months and, and more recently has been up online and we've now been able to use this. And because the technology or the fact that we're trying to use technology to remotely reach people, we can still do this during the pandemic. So what I'm going to talk about now in describing this, I'm also going to describe what looks like key principles for this that were important to us in our consultation with um, persons with lived experience of dementia and their caregivers. And numerous times we've seen so many people have challenges getting their primary care provider to believe that they have concerns. And this is certainly well known for people with uh, young onset dementia. They have quite a challenge. But that's not unique to them, certainly, but it, it certainly is more likely to occur. We see people who said for years, we see them at the memory clinic, and they say, you know, it took me two years to even get my, my primary care provider to make this referral. So I think a key principle when developing the RMC 2.0 was that patients or people living with dementia and or their family could make those referrals themselves. And part of the reason why this works is because of the nature of the specialists we use in the RMC 2.0. These specialists are not ones who are reimbursed through the healthcare system. They don't have the same kind of structural challenges. For instance, if you refer to a neurologist, you need a primary care provider referral so that neurologist can get reimbursed. Instead, these are psychologists who don't necessarily follow those models because we're not funded in the same way. So these are, as I said, I'm, you know, one aspect of this is I think, I think this part could be any clinician really with diagnosis in their scope of practice, um, but currently it's the model just because I happen to be a clinical psychologist, but I do believe it could be anyone who does not require a physician referral. And I think that patient and family direct referral is a really important part because sometimes, and for many families, we've heard throughout the years that the barrier to diagnosis, unfortunately, can exist in primary care. And another aspect in the genesis or development of RMC 2.0 was, was really informed by um, my work on De Deborah's team on the Rural Primary Healthcare Memory Clinic. And um, we have seen some challenges with continuity of staff on some teams train some physicians and then they leave, for instance. And not all teams may see the need to join. So despite um, what we think is a fantastic, excellent program, some primary, memory cl primary care clinics that have been approached said, oh, well, we don't really have enough dementia to have a challenge here. And um, in, the, in the literature, at least, there is a lack of standardization in cognitive assessment procedures um, in primary health care, which can limit um, the, the, um, the implications of those tests. So we thought we should have something that is centralized, 
and that uses technology that's accessible for rural remote family clinics. So the remote assessment is telephone-based, and you ask why is it telephone-based? Well, there's a couple of reasons this was chosen. One is telephones are ubiquitous, and everyone in rural Saskatchewan has access to uh, telephone, or very, very most people, the vast majority do. Having access to video conferencing platforms and the infrastructure required for that is, is less likely to occur, and we're seeing that now that we've developed the virtual rural memory clinics. And the other reason why we use the telephone is because we happen to have access to really good quality cognitive assessment tools that are valid for telephone use. Um, and if anyone's interested in the literature on that, I can give a nice summary of what we know thus far in remote cognitive assessment. It does, however, create the challenge for the physical exam, which has to be done in person and asynchronously. So it requires a collaborative care approach to diagnosis, which I'll talk about in a moment. Centralized staff um, is, with diagnosis in, in their scope of practice is really important. Use of remote methods facilitate um, that key principle. So you can have a staff centrally located and who serve the whole province. And a centralized intake and coordination of existing community services is pretty critical as well. And in fact, we we, when we started this project, we partnered with the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan. They have a 1-800 number to call anywhere from the province, and they have a awareness program, the ABCs of Dementia, and some of our work supports their awareness campaign because, as you know, you need to be aware that maybe you have concerns that you should get checked out. And we have a, a staff member um, paid for from the grant with the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan who is now the diagnosis and support coordinator. So this person's role is now to help support a diagnosis. And they you have existing tools, which is the getting a diagnosis toolkit, which is a guidance for how to go talk to your primary care provider. But if that still seems to be the barrier, they, they know to come to us. So this is just a little bit of a schematic of kind of the inter different ways to get um, at the RMC 2.0, um, you can go to the Alzheimer's Society 1-800 number. You can come directly to us. Uh, we do have some advertising on the website. Healthcare providers also refer to us, in part because of what we heard at the beginning. Many primary care providers, or unfortunately too many primary care providers, are not comfortable making a diagnosis of dementia and or they really want that cognitive assessment piece, which is the one piece that we, we are offering. So they refer to us, and we link with Alzheimer's Society First Link and their dementia care navigators uh, who help with care navigation through the system. But we also would be thinking about, okay, should this person, are these challenges ones that really need to be addressed by the suite of interventions in the RMCI? Or should they also be linked with the Alzheimer's Society support group? Um, but our triage into these different modes of diagnosis include if we see somebody it looks quite complicated or we shouldn't have seen them in the RMC 2.0, we will have to make a referral to the RMC. If I can't get a family, a primary care provider to engage with us to do the medical rule out, then we still have to refer the RMC where we have a neurologist, Dr. Andrew Kirk, who can do that medical evaluation. If they're in um, the southern region, obviously the rural primary care clinic, so the RMC 2.0 can be seen as a way to, as a special support in the area of measurement of cognition for that team. Um, but we also have other services like the geriatric evaluation and management team, and we also just have uh, recently in Saskatchewan, I'm happy to say, have two new geriatricians. So now we have some additional specialist services for making a diagnosis. But if it looks like from the assessment that we've done, this is a pretty clear case of typically presenting dementia due to Alzheimer's, for instance, that would be an example of a typically presenting case, then we, and it's pretty clear that we could make a diagnosis provided we have a medical rule out, we will engage in this collaborative care model. And that was just part of this grant. So collaborative care model involves multiple levels of uh, engaging with primary health care providers, and it's up to the primary health care provider to decide what level of engagement they wish to use. 
We have modified our procedures for this to be um, flexible in terms of technology. So if they want to use video conferencing, we can use video conferencing. If they just want to use the phone, they can use the phone. The whole idea here, though, is to use technology to remotely engage with the primary care provider by joining in one of their visits with their patients and family so that we can collaboratively make the diagnosis. Um, but one key principle to this is being flexible and really following the lead of the primary care provider and how they wish to engage. And I'll show you a few options here. So they can engage with us in very limited manner. For instance, all they have to do is rule out medical causes. I'm a psychologist. I can't make a diagnosis of dementia unless I have a rule out of potential medical causes that could be um, causing the presentation. Um, so in the traditional model, we would, as a neuropsychologist uh, practicing alone, I would have physicians refer to me after doing their medical rule out. They say they know no cause, and then at that point I can take over and do the diagnosis. So we can have a very similar type of model here, which is less engagement from the primary care provider. Ideally, however, we're hoping that people will engage in collaborative care and there's different levels of collaborative care where, again, we use technology to remotely join the patient, uh, the patient and family visit with their primary care provider. We're in Saskatoon. They could be in rural Saskatchewan anywhere. And um, I give them the option. Do you want us to communicate the diagnosis management plan and reporting to our uh, government agency managing driving? Uh, do you want to communicate the diagnosis so I can give you my report ahead of time? Uh, if you're the primary care provider, and you kind of lead the management plan discussion, but we, as the RMC, are the ones who do the SGI reporting. And this option came out of our work in the rural primary health care clinics, where it's pretty clear that uh, reporting to government agencies regarding potential cessation in driving or concerns about driving can really impair that primary health care relationship. And the RMC 2.0 staff would be happy to take on that role and, and help maintain that relationship that families have with their primary care providers. And of course, that the most integrated model is people, we work together much like I do with uh, Dr. Kirk in the memory clinic where we kind of communicate our findings that contribute to that diagnosis. We talk about what we think that is. We have a management plan that we kind of go back and forth in the discussion talking about. And we um, jointly do the SGI reporting. And this is just a model of the potential different options for engagement. And measuring this level of engagement is kind of one of the outcome measures from this work. So, so far, as I said, we, we got funding in March, but <laughs> the pandemic kind of hit us then. Um, so we kind of, I spent most of the summer kind of getting the RMCI up and running into different modes than using the eHealth Saskatchewan Telehealth Network, and then moving the rural memory clinic to virtual models. But at the same time, we've been able to get this up and running. And again, because we're using technology for remotely accessing people, um, we're able to do this during the pandemic. So thus far, we're getting family referrals, which is exactly one of the um, premises underlying the RMC 2.0. Um, thus far, um, we have seen some people who have too many medical issues to rule out, and that sometimes uh, for one of the cases, for instance, um, the diagnosis had to be deferred, and my report was more used to support the neurologist in their more investi um, intensive investigations. And we still have to determine the um, post-diagnostic pathways. I see a few going through our um, RMCI, depending on what their choices are, but certainly linking all of them with the resources of the Alzheimer's Society and the care navigators, which can really help a lot with future planning. And we'll be, we will be conducting interviews about the barriers and facilitators to this new process. Uh, this has not happened yet. As I said, we're still in the early stages. Um, but thus far, it's very interesting that um, we decided to use, excuse me, use telephone. And some people don't like, <laughs> some people don't like the telephone. So I've already decided to adapt this process 
just to be completely flexible. So if you have access to video conferencing and you wish to use that, we will certainly follow you. But um, the, the principle of using the telephone is to use a technology that is ubiquitous, easily accessible, and psychologically accessible. So people who don't have access to technology don't just have physical barriers, they also have psychological barriers to use. Um, so, so far, I've certainly found in terms of my time and smoothness of it, now it's partly because it's new, but definitely been a lot more challenging to engage the primary care providers. Most of them are quite happy to kind of give me the medical rule out and, and offload that diagnosis, which might not surprise any of you, but that's so far, it's, we'll see. I have had a few nurse practitioners really, really interested in that collaborative care, so, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but we will be, again, this is still early days for us, um, and we will be measuring that level of primary care engagement and trying to figure out other ways to get around if there is lack of engagement. Um, and we will be kind of qualitatively evaluating that joint diagnostic process when we actually get a chance to do it. Thus far, as I said, we've been doing asynchronous or much more uh, specialist consultation type diagnostic processes. And with the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan, we've been, um, you know, supporting the awareness campaign and really trying to increase the need, uh, awareness of the need for diagnosis. And we will be evaluating the role of the diagnosis and support coordinator in the RMC um, 2.0 and the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan. Again, as much as possible, trying to integrate our work within the existing services, supports, and awareness campaigns and very importantly, post-diagnostic supports and care navigators provided by the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan. And just a little bit about our funding. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Megan, for your presentation. I would now uh, like to ask you to answer a few questions about Rural and Remote Memory Clinic 2.0. So we will pull up some polls. Prior to this webinar, were you aware of Rural and Remote Memory Clinic 2.0, yes or no? And I know more about Rural and memory, Remote Memory Clinic 2.0 than I did before participating in this webinar on a five-point scale, strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree. We'll give you a couple moments to ans uh, answer those poll questions, and if you have any questions for Megan, please type them in the chat box in either of the two official languages. Thank you for taking the time to answer those polls. We'll now move to the Q&A and reflections portion of our webinar. Keep your comments and questions coming, and what we don't get to today we will answer and summarize in a post-webinar synopsis you will get within a few weeks to allow for translation. I will now turn it over to Mary Beth and Mimi to share some reflections on what we heard today. Mary Beth, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, another really uh, exciting uh, webinar. Um, as uh, I think I'd like to kind of almost summarize my comments into just a few different words that popped out at me. Patient quality of life and service needs, collaboration, technology, and self-referral assessment. Those, for me as a person living with dementia, are so critical in that navigation um, to when get a diagnosis and then uh, three, uh, the, the um, support to get um, afterwards. So um, both of these presentations really had some wonderful things and uh, including uh, nav uh, NavCare almost support and the 1-800 number, which I'm a huge fan of. So lots of great things here. Mel, I'm going to put this over to you, and then there's lots of questions I see that are um, waiting to be answered. Great. Thank you, Mary Beth. And Mimi, do you have just a couple of reflections on what we've heard today? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, what bears out here is um, really developing a mechanism for high, um, raising awareness of the family physician and, and primary care to be actively involved and the use of technology. I think this is, you know, it, it shows how we can be flexible with the technology, but take full advantage of it to enhance 
uh, both diagnosis and then support um, post-diagnosis uh, in terms of integrating community care uh, and allowing navigation to occur on behalf of the uh, family and, uh, and the person living with, uh, with dementia. So I congratulate uh, the teams. Uh, they've done an excellent job. And for me, it's always spread and scale. How, how can we spread this and scale this uh, across, the, across the country uh, as a true example of outstanding work that can uh, continue to support people living with dementia and their family caregivers? Thank you. Great, thank you, Nini. And I have seen quite a few questions come through the chat box. And so one of the questions was, where are the papers published? So I've made a note that I will link to the published papers that Deborah mentioned in her presentation in the synopsis that we send um, post-webinar for you, so you have access to those. Deborah, there's one question here. Is there an identified point of contact for the person receiving the diagnosis and their family? Yes, the um, the physician or the nurse practitioner is generally the point of contact, um, I think, in, in these teams. Great, thank you. Um, and then but another maybe, question, how many... Oh, oh sorry, I was just going to add that um, anyone on the team, <clears throat> the, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, whether it's social work or home care can also refer. <clears throat> Go ahead. Hello? Yes, Deborah. So the other question is, how many families can currently be seen in one day? Two, two patients and their families can be seen. They, they uh, have one assessment in the morning and then the other in the afternoon. So each takes about half a day. Great. Um, and do you offer support um, through to end of life care? Yes, there's no barriers or limits on how long the team can follow. The, they do follow up, um, and with, you know, the, the patients seen in the memory clinics are patients of that primary care team, so either of a physician in, in the clinic or um, the nurse practitioner. So, you know, they are in touch with them. They are their primary care provider, so that um, care continues. Great. And are all EMRs in Saskatchewan the same? And if not, how were the flow sheets adapted for use in different practices? Mm. Good question. We wish there was only one. Um, I guess we're fortunate here in that there are only two EMRs used in Saskatchewan. I know some other provinces have even more. Um, a challenge for us is that our EMR flow sheets were developed in, in one EMR, and we have been working to try to um, uh, work with the ministry to learn how we could get the flow sheets um, translated into uh, the other EMR in the province. And it's been a slow process, but we are still exploring that because um, most primary care teams are on med access, but there are some that are on a curo. So that's uh, something we're working towards uh, because it is a barrier to spreading. We did receive one question for both um, Deborah and Megan, it's the same question. So is there a waiting list for uh, your clinic and for RRMC 2.0? So maybe Megan will ask you to answer first and then we'll come back to Deborah to also answer that question. Sure, well we recently just advertised and we have, a, well, I shouldn't say handful. I haven't actually counted them, but probably over 10 right now that we're working through, which is not that many. Um, for a wait list, so that's not bad. Great, thank you for your answer. And Deborah, is there a wait list for your clinic as well, and how long is it? So there's four teams that are offering these clinics, and the wait time varies by team, but generally um, it's not too long uh, because they're only seeing patients of that practice. Um, a few teams are now accepting referrals from outside the team, um, and and they're tracking that to see how that affects uh, demand. Uh, but generally, they're seeing patients that are patients of the clinic team members, so it's not open to um, you know um, other patients at this point. So the wait lists are more manageable because of that. Okay. And another question regarding the 
the wait list. So would a 24-7 dementia helpline be a complementary support to mitigate both waiting time and lack of support in rural and remote jurisdictions? Well, I think for the primary health care clinics, uh, we don't run a helpline, but the Alzheimer's Society does, and I think um, Megan referred to that. So, so that support is definitely there. Great. Um, and is the health authority interested in integrating with the memory clinic and using their clinicians? The, the clinicians that are in the rural primary care memory clinics are the region's clinicians. Um, they're not ours. They are they're the regular providers for that community. So that's a strength of these clinics is that the patients and the families are very comfortable with them because they know them. They are the, the allied providers and the physicians and nurse practitioners that, um, that they know. Great. And uh, one final question. What are your goals to ensure tools will be tested before spread? What was the threshold and any insights to share with this group from that process and decision making? If that's a question for the rural primary care clinics, um, the, the only, well, I'm not sure which tools we're being asked about, but if it's the PC data EMR flow sheet tools, we uh, adapted the flow sheets developed by Dr. Seitz, and we did that in partnership with the team members, and it was very collaborative. It, was, it took several years. We iteratively designed and developed. We started out with paper versions, and then when they got into usable form, they were were put into the EMR and then continuously iteratively adapted until they worked. And as each team came on board with a little bit different configuration of team members, we adapted those EMR flow sheets until we had a, a standardized version that worked across teams with different configurations of team members so that it will work uh, uh, regardless of the, the team setting. So that was the, the process that we used to develop those. Great. Well, that's all the questions that we've received today. I would like to thank Deborah and Megan for their presentation today. I would also like to thank Mary Beth and Mimi for their thoughtful reflections and comments. Thank you to our producers, operators, and simultaneous interpreters for their efforts in making this webinar happen. Finally, thank you to you all for joining us today. In just a few moments, I will read out a few CQI questions. Your answers to these questions help us plan our future webinars. So I will read out the polls for you. Overall, I was satisfied with my webinar experience on a five-point scale, strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, and strongly disagree. Overall, I was satisfied with how I was able to actively participate in the webinar, strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. And do you have any other comments or suggestions to improve the content shared in this webinar? Once again, thank you to everyone, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar in this series on December 8, 2020. Have a great day.